Welcome back to our next episode of What's Up Prof. Today we're going to discuss a few issues that have cropped up in our late, uh, recent discussions and uh, we will get right into it. Hello Walter. How are you doing? I'm well and you? I'm fine. Can I ask for you to please open again with a word of prayer for us? There's been a complaint that I am always the one that is praying. So I think you can show them today that you are also a prayer warrior. Absolutely. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you very much for giving us the privilege to come into your throne room and we can stand in service of you. We ask that you bless this discussion and that you open our minds with the Holy Spirit's inworking and that you will bless the people that watch this. In Jesus' name, Amen. So what are the issues we are going to discuss today? Well, there are quite a few issues that the people in the discussion in our previous videos bring up and they would like to know what our position on these issues is. That's a good point. Uh, some of these issues are, for instance, the 5G, the chip, mark of the beast that we've already discussed in the previous lectures. And I would just like to tell the viewers, you know, this is a discussion. This is not an in-depth um, study of these issues. So when we do this discussion, we will put links to lectures that do in-depth discussions of these issues. So we encourage you, please go and have a look at the links and most of your questions in the discussions will be answered through those lectures. So if it's okay with you, let's discuss some of it and what is your thoughts on this broad spectrum of all these questions. Yeah, my, my position is actually quite simple. <clears throat> what do we believe? Why do we believe it? What is our duty in terms of the times we are living in? And I think there's a lot of confusion out there because as you raise the point there, there are so many issues that people are bringing in at the moment which clamor for the attention of the mind that the, the broad objective of preaching the gospel is getting lost in the background noise. And uh, I find it fascinating that we should have all of these points uh, being raised. You mentioned the feasts. Yes. Uh, the question of the deity of Christ. Yes. Uh, the Godhead and uh, all of these theological issues which now seem to be uh, concentrated in this time in which we are living. The issue of perfection. Mm. Uh, how perfect must we be in order to stand before God when, when He comes? What is the position that we must attain to uh, all of these questions are, are circulating on the internet at the moment and are clamoring for attention. So let us make it quite clear that people understand where we are coming from. Uh, we are Seventh-day Adventists. Yes. Now, Seventh-day Adventism doesn't always have <laughs> <It's not. laughs> the best press, if I can put it that way. But basically, Seventh-day Adventism is very simple. Now, I'm not uh, a Seventh-day Adventist because I subscribe to a particular creed that has been set up by a group which is known as Seventh-day Adventist. I'm a Bible believer. Yes. This is my, this is my manual. And without this manual, I would be totally lost. So my primary source of information is the Word of God. But there are thousands of denominations that claim that their primary source is the Word of God. Correct. So how do you read this primary source? And uh, that is a very important question. So why am I a seventh day? Adventists. Let's make that quite clear. Well, th let's break the name down. Seventh-day Adventist. 
there's a message in that. It's not just a name. Mm. Correct. Uh, the message is you keep the seventh day. Because in Genesis it already says, and God bless the seventh day. I, yes. can, I can actually go you to can. Genesis chapter 2 and see that this is not a Jewish law at all. It is an Edenic law. It comes from Eden. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. This is now Genesis chapter 2. And all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he rested from all the work which God created and made. Uh, it's it's uh, pretty... Quite clear. <laughs> yeah, it's an absolutely clear statement. Now people will say, how do you know what's the seventh day? Yes, because now they bring in lunar Sabbaths and, uh, and or lunar day, yeah. th calendars and all this. Well, when God created this cycle of the week, there was no moon <laughs> yes. to reckon from because that only came on the fourth day, right? So he couldn't have used the lunar Sabbath to determine the Sabbath. He was counting the days. And it, it starts with, and it was evening and it was morning, the first day. Day, day and the second day. day. So it's a counting of the days. So how do we know that uh, the seventh day is still the seventh day? And he, he blessed it and he set it aside for holy use. And it comes up over and over and over as you go through the Old Testament. Yes. And uh, it continues throughout the New Testament. It's not as though it just suddenly disappears, like no. some people would like to say. Now, if the Sabbath was instituted in Eden according to a cycle which God established, irrespective of a moon and a sun or whatever criterion, just basically on the counting of the days, yes. then how do we know that we still have the Sabbath today? And the answer is simple. God instituted it in Eden. If the Sabbath should ever have been lost along the line somewhere, then when God took the children of Israel before Sinai yes. out of Egypt, he let the manna rain and the manna fell. And on a Friday, there was twice as much and on the Sabbath, there was none. Correct. So for 40 years, the manna fell. And for 40 years, he drilled into their minds and into their innermost being, which day was the Sabbath. Because there was none on the Sabbath. And on the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, there was twice as much. Yes. He spoke it in great solemnity from Mount Sinai. So if ever it should have been lost between creation and a later stage, it was certainly reinstated right there. Isn't that correct? Correct. Okay. So now, what if uh, the Jews had gotten it mixed up and, and missed a day somewhere? Uh, would they then have the same Sabbath still? Well, the answer is really quite simple. Should they have lost it, which they didn't, but should they have lost it, then very definitely it is reinstated when you get to the crucifixion. Yes. Because it says it was the preparation when Jesus was crucified. He was dead at the died at the ninth hour, which is around about three o'clock in the afternoon. He was in the grave. They rushed to get him into the grave. And then they rested in accordance with the commandment. And very early on the first day of the week, the new translations even say Sunday, yeah. he rose from the dead. So they rested according to the commandment. As his custom was on the Sabbath, as Paul's custom was on the Sabbath. I mean, it's there. Yes. So 
But what calendar was in effect in the New Testament? It was the Julian calendar. Yes. So the Julian calendar was in effect, so you know exactly what day that was. Now the Julian calendar was changed into the Gregorian calendar at the initiative of Pope Gregory. And that calendar changed the days, I mean changed the dates, yes. but never changed the cycle of the, the week. week. So it maintained the exact same cycle. So the Sabbath has never been lost. And all the great astronomical studies that have been made clearly show that the seventh day is Saturday. And you can, you can take an ordinary Oxford dictionary and look up Saturday. Yes. And it'll tell you it's the seventh day of the week. And you can look up the word Sunday and it'll tell you it's the first day of the week. So seventh day Adventist. An Adventist is someone who believes that Jesus Christ will come, come again. again. And if you want to uh, take a very simple text to look at some of these issues, you can go to John chapter 14, which I, which I love because it is a mini Bible in one verse explaining the whole doctrines where Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Yes. We should all know this verse off by heart, by the way. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Yes. Then there's the promise. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. again. That's an Adventist. He believes that Jesus is going to come again. Not on some assumption. The Bible is replete with the promise of the coming of Christ. In fact, it's the blessed hope. That was the verse that made it all clear for me. It made it clear for you? In becoming an Adventist. Okay, so you were not an Adventist all your life, neither no. was I. And uh, uh, let me make it quite plain. <laughs> It will take a tremendous amount of conviction before anybody in his right mind will change from what he was in the world to become a Seventh-day Adventist. Absolutely. It's it, life change. It's either <laughs> a record of total insanity or it must be based on something very substantial, right? That's... If you ask me, that's what this, and that word is truth. Truth. Okay. So let's just finish this. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. Now, if you analyze this verse, when will God's people be with him? When he comes, comes again. To fetch you. Now, what does the popular theology say? That everybody goes to heaven as soon as they die. Yes. So what's the point of coming again to fetch them if they're there already, right? Exactly. No point whatsoever. And he's going to prepare a place and he's going to come again. And, and you know, the seventh day is one of the Ten Commandments. Yes. And if you read on here in, in this beautiful chapter, John chapter 14, in verse 15 says, If you love me, keep my commandments. Yes. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that he may be able to abide with you forever. And he's the Spirit of truth. And you said truth, right? That's it. So this is all fascinating. Then verse 21 says, He that has my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Me. That's not... It's not rocket science. No. 
And it's not, it doesn't mention there nine commandments? No, it says all of them. And, and, and John the, the, is the author of this, of this gospel, and he's citing Jesus Christ. Yes. Later on, in his, in his epistles, he, he gets a little bit more forceful and says, He that says he loves him and keeps not his commandments is a liar, yes. and the truth is not, not in them. Him. So, you know, what is it to be an Adventist? It's someone who keeps the seventh day yes. because he's learned to love God and therefore he keeps his commandments, not because he's forced to, There's but nice because he's convicted. Yes, that's a, I, I think it was um, James White that said, and I love the, the phrase, we don't keep the commandments to be saved. We keep the commandments because we are saved. Exactly. So it is, a, it is something that flows out of the relationship that you have developed. In any case, so a Seventh-day Adventist is someone who takes God at his word. He believes that God created the world in six days. That was a major problem for me. Yes. I mean, I was an evolutionist, then I was an atheist. I mean, this is ridiculous. God created the world in six days until you start studying it. Yes. And then you, you find so much evidence that uh, <laughs> your cage is totally rattled, right? And uh, if people want to watch, there's a whole series on creation yeah. evolution that I did. I wrote a book called Genesis Conflict. And uh, I mean, the evidence is just overwhelming. I cannot even believe that I used to be an evolutionist, a convicted evolutionist. Yes. So that is what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist. And an Adventist has a particular message and has a particular um, constitution, if you like. And you find that in Revelation chapter 12 and 13. And, and let me just read what it says there. After giving a description of the Christian church and its persecutions through the ages, and uh, an Adventist believes the evangelical gospel yes. of, of, uh, of Protestantism. And so it talks here about uh, the, the persecution in the Middle Ages and all of these issues. And then it talks about a remnant with which the dragon, the devil, is not very pleased. Yeah. And it says, and the dragon was wroth with the woman, and the woman in the Bible is a church and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. So the last church on earth, what will it look like? And the criteria is, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus, Jesus. Christ. Those are two criteria. The two legs. The two legs. And then they have a particular message. And Revelation chapter 13 is the very heart of the message. And it describes the beasts of Revelation 13, which are a conglomerate beast of Daniel chapter 7, by the way. And another power, another political power that will enforce these entities. And we discussed that last time and we, we referred the people to the lecture, the two beasts become yes. friends. So here is a particular message that is given, and we find it particularly in Revelation chapter 14, this remnant that keeps the commandments of God. Because again in chapter 14 in verse 12, it refers to this criteria where it says, here's the patience of the saints, here are they which keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus, which is more than the faith in Jesus, right? Correct. It entails the faith in Jesus, but it also believes what Jesus believed. Yes. And then it gives the three angels' messages. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, and then there are these three angels. The first one is the everlasting gospel, and that you must worship God who is the creator, and the sign of his creation is the Sabbath. Correct. And the second one is the religious systems of the world that reject these basic truths become part of Babylon. 
And the third one is, do not accept the mark of the beast. That's what all these questions were about. Yes, there's a lot of confusion about the mark of the beast. Now, we spoke about that last time, so I don't think we should no. repeat it. But, but we've got all the links to the in-depth studies about it. But there was this question about the mark being received in the hand and in the forehead. So people said, but that definitely now refers to the chip that will be implanted under the skin because it says in the hand and in the forehead. Well, let me put you, your mind at rest. The Bible also says that God will give his saints a place in his throne. Now, excuse me, if you want to take that in terms of the linguistics of modern English, are you going to sit within the throne? Or are you going to be boxed up within the throne? So when the Bible talks about in, you will be in the throne. That means you will be totally part of the decision making. It has to do with decision making. So it's interesting that when you, when you read about the seal of God, which is the Sabbath, by the way, Yes. God says uh, that he will write his laws in our hearts, right? And he says that the, the seal, the Sabbath, must be in the hand and in the forehead. And he says, and. And. Not or. Not or. Whereas the mark of the beast can be either in the hand or the forehead. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you receive it in the hand, it means you will act accordingly. Not necessarily by conviction, but by compulsion. Because there's the law, and if you don't obey the law, then well, you won't be able to buy or sell. So therefore, you go along with it, whether you agree with it or not. You receive it in the hand. Those that receive it in the forehead, well, in the forehead, behind the forehead, is your frontal lobe, where your decision-making capacity is, yes. then you will have received it by conviction. Now, there are many preachers that preach that the first day of the week is now the new Sabbath, and that is their conviction, without one single Bible verse to corroborate their view. So, this is the issue. What are we going to believe? Are we going to believe the Word of God as it stands? Or are we going to believe the theologians as they perceive it? If I can ask you on that point, a lot of them say that Sunday is the Lord's Day. Yes. Now, if you go uh, look at this word, the Lord's Day, there are only two places where it actually talks about this. And the one is in Isaiah where it says that the Sabbath is the Lord's day. Yes. Jesus says that he is Lord of the Sabbath, Sabbath, and John is in vision on the Lord's day. Now, with what right do you say that that is Sunday? Yes. Uh, only by papal decree has it been called Sunday. There is no verse which says that he was in vision on a Sunday. So that is a pure conjecture on the side of Roman Catholicism, which has been um, absorbed by the evangelicals. Yes. The Bible is very clear. The Lord's Day is Saturday, the Sabbath day, Isaiah chapter 58. Jesus was referring to the Sabbath day when he said he was Lord of the Sabbath. And John was in vision on the Lord's Day which is the Sabbath. And without a counter-argument to prove it otherwise, that's the way it is. Yes. So those are the issues. And uh, we can jump to another uh, issue that they, the people also have, is the secret rapture. Yes. Now, is there a secret rapture? Well, the Bible says the coming of the Son of Man will be like lightning that is visible from the east to the west. 
the Bible says that if you hear, he's here, and if you hear, he's there, and he's in the inner room or he's in the desert, do not go, because coming will be universally visible. Now, there's nothing secret about the universally visible coming of Christ. What will happen at the coming of Christ? God will separate the wicked from the just. So they use a verse like, for example, two will be grinding mm. at a grindstone. One will be taken and the other one not. Now, let's not go into the depth of that yeah. verse, but where does it say that the one is taken secretly? It doesn't say that at all. Yeah. Everywhere in the Bible it says God will give his angels charge and they will come and they will separate the wicked from the just. And it says that those that are living the righteous living will be changed in an instant in the twinkling of an eye and the resurrected in Christ together with them will be taken and meet the Lord in the air. Now, excuse me, where does this secret rapture come from? Uh, and where is this resurrection of the just that has to take place simultaneously with the translation of the living? Those aspects are not in that theology at all. So where does this theology come from? It's a Jesuit theology. It's not a biblical theology. And none of the reformers ever believed it. So it is a modern evangelical view that has been taken over from a Jesuitical teaching, which was introduced to take the heat of the papacy as Antichrist, because that is what the Reformers said. The Reformers said that the papacy was Antichrist. And so the Jesuits came up with two counter-Reformation um, theologies, theologies, Futurism and Preterism. Yes. Preterism put the Antichrist activities into the past, and they claimed that a Greek king, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, mm -hmm. Uh, fulfilled the criteria of the little horn power of Daniel and that that was the Antichrist. Now, uh, it's not biblical yes. because the Bible says in Daniel that the Antichrist comes out of the fourth beast, which is Rome, and not out of the third beast, which is Greece. Greece. Mm -hmm. So it cannot be uh, a Greek king. Now, it's interesting that the, the conservative theological seminaries and universities first adopted this um, preterism yes. and said that it was Antiochus Epiphanes. I had, a, I had a, an evangelical, I won't mention the denomination, come to my home and he gave me that theory. And I went through Daniel chapter 7 with him and I said, now please explain to me this power comes out of the fourth beast and yours now comes out of the third beast. So uh, how do you explain that? He got so upset that uh, he had a young man with him. He, he closed his ears and he marched him out of the house so that he shouldn't become confused by what the Bible says on that issue. Now the other one is, is futurism. Mm where they say the Antichrist will come in the future. And what they do there is they take the last week of the 70 weeks of Daniel yes. and transport it into the future. This is also where the secret rapture links onto. Correct. Now, uh, this theology again is a Jesuit theology and it was embellished by Cardinal Bellamino as a Jesuit. Mm. And... Uh, uh, this theology is believed by the evangelicals today. It was never believed by the reformers. They were absolutely clear. And you don't have to be an Adventist to understand it. You can go to the, the writings of the reformers. Or you don't even have to go to their writings, which are replete in that sort of thing. Yes. You can go to um, the Church of England theologians, for example, Gratan Guinness. Yes wrote a book, uh, Romanism and the Reformation, in which he takes the, the Protestant position and clearly delineates it from the book of Daniel. There is not a shadow of doubt as to what they believed. Yes. Why don't they believe it anymore? Has the Bible changed? Mm. 
definitely not. The sentiment has changed. And do you know, do you know what brought it in? Is when Protestantism changed its stance. That's when the problem came in. Through ecumenism, it was necessary to lay aside doctrine in order to accommodate the diversity that is out there. Because if two walk together and they have two different theologies, well, it's going to create controversy. Yes. So let's put the doctrine aside. In fact, the Pope said, we have to put doctrine aside. Yes. So what becomes the norm then? The spirit. Yes. But the spirit that is not in harmony with the word is not the spirit of God. Yes. So the reformers had this saying, sola scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone. That's your criterion. And if the spirit speaks contrary to the word, then it's not the spirit of God. That's why Isaiah 8 verse 20 says, to the law, which is the Torah, the yes. Bible, and the testimony, it's what the prophets wrote. If they speak not according to this word, they have no light in them. Yes. And uh, that is where this confusion comes in. We have to get away from these evangelical doctrines of a secret rapture, because there's no such thing in the Bible. It contradicts the very plainest verses. And we have to get back to the biblical teaching of what it says in this word then this confusion would end. Another issue that they bring up constantly is the 5G and how this might be the cause of coronavirus and all sorts of other causes. Is there something you would like to say on this? <laughs> I don't know how many videos I've received and how many documents regarding the 5G and that this is the big issue at the moment and is causing all the problems. Be that as it may, is this what we are to concentrate on at the moment? For example, uh, let's just think logically. 5G, they say that the radiation is problematic. Well, all radiation, in a sense, is problematic. Now the human being is exposed to so much radiation that uh, it's astounding that we cope so well. Mm. And uh, uh, cell phones or handies as they call them in some places, they, they work on a, a, a microwave frequency. And then this is compared to the normal microwave that cooks things and uh, Yes, the vibrations are very dangerous and we must take into account the high concentrations, etc., etc. But whenever something new comes out, there's this, this major hype about what it can do to your body. And yes, we have to be careful and we have to be sensible and we have to protect ourselves from all of these things. Now, 5G, they're saying, has a frequency which will interfere with oxygen absorption. And therefore, these people have been falling over as a consequence of 5G. Now, if that were the case, if there was a 5G transmitter and it interfered with oxygen uptake, then why wouldn't many more people just fall over? Why one here and one there? And you, you see all of these videos. And it creates fear, and it creates uh, suspicion. And the question I have, are these not all side issues that are so geared to occupy our mind that we miss the point? Uh, do you basically then want to say that we don't have to worry about like the 5G and the chip that has to, can be implanted? I have never said that we don't have to worry about these things. I said these are not the issues that are the heart of the biblical criteria that we're talking about. Is it important to make sure that I eat correctly so that I protect my body? Yes. So it's an important issue, correct? 
but it is an issue that enlightens my mind and makes me capable of absorbing greater realities. It, uh, health and health reform is not my religion. Yes. It is a consequence of my religion. Uh, my body is not my own, it belongs to God. So is it important that I protect myself? Absolutely. If I know something is dangerous, then I will protect myself. If I work in a radiology lab and I work with x-rays, am I going to wear protective clothing? Yes. Obviously, because I know what the issue is. Can I protect myself against every ray that is out there in the world? How many rays have we got right here around us now at the moment? Yes. Unbelievable, right? Lots. Every little piece of information in the entire world is floating around our ears right now. Did you know that? Yes. Do you know that? Do you know that passing between us now in this sacred forum where we're talking about the issues of God, we have pornography streaming past us right now? Yes. Did you know that? All I need is the right instrument to catch it. And I can watch it. Does that mean I want to watch it? No. No. And if it pops up, should I watch it? No. no. So that is not the issue. The issue is what is happening now? Where are we in the stream of time? Correct. What must happen in here in terms of my relationship with God? That's what is what I'm saying. If you know that something is dangerous, then take every measure that you can to protect yourself yes. from whatever that issue is. And if you've done what you can, then you must leave the consequences to God. Correct. If I had to be concerned about what I eat to the point of not trusting anything in a store because I don't know how they prepared it, I could drive myself insane. Yes. So, you take the best precautions that you can, you wash your food, you try and buy the best food that you can possibly buy for your body, and then you get to the point where you say, I've done what I can. Yes. And now I leave the consequences to God. I can take every device, uh, a cell phone, and I can throw it away because it is dangerous. But you're sitting right next to me with a, f with a cell phone in your pocket probably. Yes. And so is the next one and the next one. And all this information is out there. I have an interesting theory. I I'm way off the topic now. But uh, who created all the various forms of radiation? Did man create them or did God create originally? Yes all the things that we are now harnessing with instruments. We have an instrument to harness everything. If we want to know about x-rays, x-rays exist. Yes. But I need an instrument to monitor it and to use it. Uh, microwaves exist. exist. Uh, ultraviolet waves. radiation exists. I cannot see ultraviolet, but a bee can. Yes. A bee has an instrument to pick it up and to actually see what's going on in a sphere that I'm incapable of. Uh, I'm wondering if God has something exciting waiting for us, mm -hmm. that one day we will be able to tune into all of those frequencies and yes. gain the information that he has put into the world. Maybe one day I can look at a leaf and actually look right into it to see the very mechanisms of its workings. I don't know what the future is going to be, but it's going to be amazing. That's for certain. So we harness all of these things. Mm. And I'm not saying that certain things are not dangerous or are dangerous. What I'm saying is when you get to the point where there's nothing you can do about it, yes. then focus on the greater realities which are written yes. in the Word of God. I agree. All the side issues must become small. Exactly. You were talking about other side issues. Uh, the feasts. Yes. The anti-Trinitarian movement. Yes. The deity of Christ. The 
Whatever. What were the others? I can't even remember. No, oh, like we've mentioned the lunar sabbaths and all the, of these the, things. Let's not go there. We've, yeah. we've spoken we've about it already in a sense. But to me, a non-negotiable would be the deity of Christ. If Christ is not God, then he could not have laid down his life and taken it up again. He says, nobody takes it from me. I lay it down and I take it up again. One, uh, ch John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was, was God. Everything was created by Him and for, for Him. Without Him was not anything created. Uh, Jesus so often referred to Himself in deistic language that the Jews picked up stones to stone him because he was making himself God. Yes. He received worship. The deity of Christ to me is a non-negotiable issue. Yes. So when you talk about the, the Trinity, for example, uh, where they say there's, only, there's one, they start with the Holy Spirit and say, okay, the Holy Spirit is not part of, of the Godhead. It is the Spirit of Christ and the Spirit of, of the Father. So let's get rid of that. Then we must still work to one, and you still have two, right? Eventually they get to the point where Christ is a lesser deity. Mm. Uh, he has a, a deity that has been given him or lent him. Created being. Yeah. Uh, Basically, you get to the point where he has to be a created being. Now, that's where I will draw the line. The deity of Christ is a non-negotiable for me. And therefore, all of these arguments, which go round and round mm -hmm. and round, and take the attention of God's people, take us away from the message for the time. Yes. And the message for the time is clearly given in, in the book of Revelation. What is present truth? We have to restore the everlasting gospel. The gospel has never changed. Yes. Now, why is that important? Because people out there teach a gospel of dispensation, which means that for every generation period, there is a different way of salvation. Uh, so you had the period where you were saved by the, keeping the law and then you did away with the law. Now you have to be saved by grace yes. without the law. And then in the future you'll have the dispensation of the kingdom, which again has different criteria because the Christians won't be there. They will be raptured, etc., etc. That is so far removed from biblical teaching that it boggles the mind how anyone could accept this Jesuitical teaching. Mm. And let's face it, the Jesuits have been the enemies of the Word of God from the beginning. They called the Bible this poisonous asp. Mm. If uh, you read their creed, yes. it's enough to give you chills. Absolutely. So it is so far removed from this Bible as the east is from the west, as the, as the heavens are removed from the deepest ocean. Where in the Bible do you have a dispensation? Adam and Eve were saved by the blood of the Lamb. There was a Lamb that was slaughtered, and the coats that they wore were the coat of the Lamb. In other words, the righteousness of Christ covered them. Cain's offer was rejected because he brought the works of his hands. Roman Catholicism insists that you are saved but through works mm. and call it an anathema to say that you are saved and justified by the grace of Christ alone. Cain's offer was not accepted. Abel, who brought the lamb according to the criteria, was accepted because he realized salvation was outside of him. How was a Jew saved? By keeping the law? No, he had to bring a lamb. Yes. He had to place his hands upon the lamb. He had to confess yes. his sins over the lamb. He had to take the knife and cut the throat of the lamb to demonstrate the fact that he, a sinner, 
was responsible for the death of the anti-typical Lamb of God that John, John the Baptist referred to. Salvation has always been through the yes. blood of the Lamb. I think actually the Jews had it not so easy as us. No. Because they had to do it physically to see what the Savior has done for us. Exactly. Now the, not, the other point is, was obedience a prerequisite for remaining in Eden? Absolutely. Absolutely. So when they disobeyed, they lost access to Eden, right? So now should uh, obedience not be a criterion at the end? Did God realize he made a mistake? Mm -hmm and doesn't require obedience? Then why does he say not one jot or one tittle will by any means disappear out of the law? Yeah. And that nothing in the law will be changed. Why does he insist upon the fact that only those that keep the commandments of God will have access to the tree of life? Revelation 22 verse 14. Absolutely. And what is the Revelation 22 verse 15? It tells you if you don't keep the commandments, then you're part of the rest of the exactly. people that stay outside of the gospel. So it has never changed. So this gospel of dispensations, which is the evangelical norm in many, many circles, is a Jesuit doctrine which is not biblical, which was never believed by the reformers and should never be believed by anyone who trusts in this word of God. Let me say it categorically. You have all of these arguments that you now have to, let's say, keep the feasts. I'm not arguing the fact whether we should or should not. I'm just saying you have all of these issues coming in. The anti-Trinitarian doctrine, the, the feasts, the lunar Sabbaths, the this, the that, the perfectionism. And all of this is geared to keep the saints busy. But what is their job? Why did Jesus come to this world? Why did Jesus leave the 99 saved angels behind to come and seek and save the lost on this planet? Because he loved us. And love, agapeo, is unselfish love. It doesn't revolve around self. All of those issues revolve around self. Am I perfect? Am I good enough? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that you mustn't strive to do what is right. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying these issues of keeping God's people busy, instead of preaching the gospel to the lost, we are focusing on self. And it should stop. Yes. We should have one mission. I know what I believe. And I must work up my salvation, my own salvation with fear and trembling before God. And I have a personal relationship with him and that is what everybody should have. And you need time to study the word of God and you need to have time to be with God, but you have a commission. Yes. And the commission is, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. The everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel that has never changed. changed. That is our commission. And if we miss that point, because we're so concerned with our own self, then we will miss out on a major blessing. Because only as you give to others, can you receive yourself? It is a double-edged sword. And only as you forgive, you are forgiven. And one more point. If you do not believe exactly like any of these groups believe, you are apostate. Mm. So I, <laughs> when, I, when I read what some of these people say and some of the web pages out there, I must be the most apostate person on the planet because everybody has a gripe. Either this group or that yeah. group or <laughs> whatever, within and without the church. Yes. Let me say it again, categorically. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. As far as the church is concerned, 
I am, what they say, in good and regular standing. Yes. I am an ordained minister of the church. And I have received many labels. Mm -hmm. In the church. In the church. And without the church. Some claim I'm a conspiracist. Why? Because I believe what the Bible says in Revelation and what it says in the book of Daniel. And it is amazing to me that that which we have preached for over 30 years in my case is fulfilling before our very eyes. Yes, correct. So was it a conspiracy or was it a prophecy? And some people, yeah? You must just, I think, make it clear that you don't say you're a prophet because some people might now put that label on you. <laughs> that would be the most horrendous <laughs> thing that could ever happen. I'm just someone who loves the Word of God. I am fascinated with prophecy. In fact, prophecy pulled the rug out from under my feet. If you don't mind, if I can come in with a side note, because I would, uh, before we close off, I would like you to discuss this as well, because Adventism stands on two legs. And you mentioned the one already. We've discussed the commandments. Would you mind bringing in the other leg now with all this prophecy that you're going to be talking about? Yes. <laughs> Here are they that keep the commandments and have the testimony of Jesus. And the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Prophecy is a very central part of Adventism as well. Now, prophecy was a tremendous part of um, Protestantism. In fact, the very first book that Martin Luther translated from the Old Testament mm. was the book of Daniel. Yes. I mean, if you start translating the Old Test Testament, why wouldn't you start with the book of Genesis? Yes. Why would you start with the book of Daniel? And he said, God's people need the book of Daniel. So we can understand where we are in the stream of time. And because all of these prophecies in the book of Daniel culminate with the coming of Christ. And when I started studying the Bible and I found Daniel. Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8 and 9. And, and you see these magnificent prophecies. And... Uh, you don't have to take an Adventist word. Go, as I said, read Grattan, Guinea's uh, Romanism and the Reformation, and you can see exactly what the Reformers believed and how logical their arguments were. They are indisputable in their logic. When I studied that, I realized that this may not be lost. And it changed me from an atheist to a believer. Because how could God with such accuracy, hundreds of years before the events, describe these issues with the exact year of the coming of Messiah yes. predicted in the Bible? And then all the issues pertaining to the end and what would happen and they're being fulfilled one after the other before our very eyes. We should actually have a, a talk as to exactly where we are in the stream of time. Because people believe it can still be hundreds of years before Christ yes. comes. No, it is at the door, even at the door. And we need to talk about I that. I think we issue. can work that into a special, edition, a special episode that we can put in. We need to talk about that. And we need to be careful that we don't mix the prophetic interpretation of the Bible with the interpretation that has been given by futurist thinking. Yes, the counter-reformation. Which yes. comes from the courts of the Jesuits. Mm. So we have to clearly distinguish them. So yes, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And uh, I don't believe that I am apostate even if some of these people think that uh, I think differently from them, therefore I must be uh, off the wall somewhere. And uh, it's important that 
if people say that I have become this or that or the other, don't believe it. I'm just an old-fashioned Adventist who believes as the pioneers believed. I believe the Bible. I believe the spirit of prophecy. I believe in obedience to God's requirements, not as a means to salvation, but as a consequence of salvation. And I believe that the final message for the world is the three angels' message, and that all of these side issues, you can study them if you like in your private time, but when it comes to your public time, concentrate on the Word of God. Amen. Perhaps we can discuss the spirit of prophecy in a broader terms in the next episode. Absolutely, we can do that. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe, click here. When the bell appears, click and you will receive notifications. To watch the next one, click here. Thank you again and see you next time.